Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. On Friday evening, October 1st, 1993... 12-year-old Polly Kloss and her two friends were having a slumber party at her home in Petaluma, California, a quiet community about 40 miles north of San Francisco. The girls were having fun playing Nintendo, board games, and trying on makeup and Halloween costumes. Polly and her friends, Kate and Jillian, sat on her bedroom floor and played a board game. Then, Polly got up to retrieve their sleeping bags from the living room. She opened the bedroom door and froze. A burly stranger holding a six-inch knife stood in the hallway. He pushed his way into the room and told the girls, Don't scream or I'll slit your throat. At first... Polly's friends thought this might be one of her relatives pulling a prank. But when the man ordered the girls to lie face down on the floor and roughly tied their hands behind their backs, they realized this was no joke. A real-life boogeyman had just broken into the house. I'm Carrie Mulligan, the host of I Hear Fear, a new anthology series of terror. You and I know that the best scary stories are the ones we tell each other in the dark. So turn off your lights and close your eyes. Follow I Hear Fear on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, it's me, the OG Green Grump, the Grinch. Listen as I launch a campaign against Christmas cheer, grilling celebrity guests like chestnuts on an open fire. They'll try to get my heart to grow a few sizes, but it's not going to work, honey. Follow Tis the Grinch Holiday Talk Show on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. From Wondery and Treefort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the third season of Killer Psych. I was a psychiatric nurse and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode is Richard Allen Davis. Polly's story started earlier that day, around 3 p.m., after her mother, Eve Nickel, picked her daughters, Polly and Annie, up from school. Polly begged her mom to let some friends spend the night. Eve said yes, but on the condition she had to clean up her room. And Polly was more than happy to do that. In the last year, the pretty seventh grader with big brown eyes and curly shoulder-length hair had finally found a tight group of friends. They were all smart girls who played in the band and participated in school plays. Polly was the group's practical joker, and she loved making her friends laugh. Eve was happy to see her daughter blossoming after a few bumpy years. Polly's parents, Eve and Mark, divorced when she was three. Eve remarried and had Annie, but later separated from Annie's father. And the girls move with their mother into a two-bedroom rental house in Petaluma. After her parents' divorce, Polly remained close to her father, Mark. She often spent weekends at his house and they talked on the phone every night when she was at her mother's. 
Around 3.30 that day, Eve dropped her daughters at home and returned to work. While Eve was at work, Polly straightened up her bedroom. At one point, she retrieved the vacuum cleaner from the service porch off the kitchen. The service porch was located at the back of the house. It contained a small bathroom, which was accessible from the outside for the renter in the granny unit behind Polly's house. In October 1993, the unit was occupied by a young man. After she finished vacuuming, Polly returned the vacuum cleaner to the service porch closet but she forgot to lock the kitchen door. Eve returned home at about 5.30 and ordered pizza. While she ate dinner, Polly talked with her dad, Mark, on the phone, and they talked about the slumber party. They said they loved each other, as they usually did, and hung up. At 7 p.m., Polly's friend Jillian arrived, and sometime after 8 p.m., Kate's mother dropped her off at Polly's. Inside the house, the girls carried on laughing and joking and just having a grand time. Two hours later, Eve knocked on Polly's door and told the girls that she had a migraine and was going to bed. After checking the front door, she joined her younger daughter, Annie, in her bedroom, took a sleeping pill, and quickly fell asleep. At the same time that the girls were playing a board game, another group of friends were in the granny unit behind Polly's house watching a movie. A friend of the renter, Sean Bush, got up to smoke a cigarette and he did that in the doorway. From where he was standing, Sean could see the granny unit's bathroom, which was located on Eve Nichols' back porch. At 10.30 p.m., Sean caught a movement on the driveway. He looked and very clearly saw a stocky man with dark, bushy hair, a salt and pepper beard, dressed in dark clothing and carrying a bag. The man was calmly and slowly walking towards him. The man looked up at Sean before turning and stepping up the stairs of the back service porch. He acted so casually, Sean would later say that he did not think there was anything suspicious about him and went back inside to continue watching the movie with his friends. Moments later, Polly stood up and went to retrieve the sleeping bags from the living room. She opened the door and was suddenly face-to-face with a bearded, middle-aged man with wild hair, brandishing a six-inch knife. The large man barged into the room and loomed over the girls. He promised not to hurt anyone as long as they did what he instructed. He told all three girls to lie face down on the floor and not look at him. Then he demanded to know who lived in the house. Polly answered, I do. Don't hurt my mom or sister. The stranger had brought ligatures made from a white silky material to tie the girls' hands behind their backs. Once the girls were all tied up, he asked, Where are the valuables? The man repeatedly told them not to be scared because he only wanted money. Polly told him there was $30 stored in a jewelry box, but he made no move to get it. He took pillowcases off the bed and pulled them over the girls' heads. Then he gagged them. He then said, stand up, and Jillian started to get up. He pushed her back down. Not you, you, and he grabbed Polly. He told the other girls to count to 1,000, after which Polly would be back. 
Jillian and Kate heard the front screen door swing open and bang shut. The intruder had only been inside the bedroom for 10 minutes. The girls stopped counting after a few minutes and worked to free themselves. Jillian was a gymnast and she was able to contort her body to bring her arms to the front. After using her teeth to untie the wrist restraints, she then freed her friend Kate. The girls woke up Eve and told her that a man had entered the bedroom and taken Polly. Eve immediately called the police. Her 911 call was logged at 11.03 p.m. Petaluma police arrived at 11.15. About 40 minutes after Polly was snatched from her home, 19-year-old Shannon Lynch was driving down a private road on a large rural property in Oakmont, California, about 26 miles north of Petaluma. Shannon had just left the home of Dana Jaffe, where she had been watching Dana's 12-year-old daughter. About 100 feet from the front gate, Shannon unexpectedly came across a stranger and his car stuck in a ditch. She cracked her driver's side window and asked the man, what was he doing on private property? The man responded by saying he needed a rope to get out of the ditch. Shannon pointed out the no trespassing signs posted everywhere. In response, the man approached her car, gripped his fingers over her slightly open window, and ordered her to get out of the car. Then he demanded to know who lived in the house up the driveway. Shannon responded, people who will call the cops. She floored the gas pedal and went in search of a payphone. She had to warn Dana. I just want to say here, Shannon did exactly what she should have done. And the first thing she did right was don't roll the window down. She just had it open a crack. If that window had been down, there's no doubt in my mind, his hands would have been around her neck and she would also be a victim in this story. Shannon called Dana and told her about the scary stranger on her property. Dana and her daughter wasted no time. They jumped in her car and fled. They drove past the white hatchback, but saw no sign of the driver. Dana found a payphone and called 911 and told them she feared for her safety. Sonoma County Sheriff's deputies drove up Pythian Road and onto her driveway. The trespasser was now leaning against his car, calmly smoking a cigarette. The officers asked him for his driver's license and learned he was 39-year-old Richard Allen Davis. Police immediately noticed that Davis was covered, including his hair, with leaves, twigs, and other debris. He claimed that he tried putting branches and dirt and leaves under the car wheels to gain traction, although the officers noted there were no branches or debris under the tires. Okay, lie number one. They asked why he entered private property, and he said hang on to your hats, that he had been sightseeing and got lost. Lie number two. He had tried turning around, he said, but got stuck in the ditch against the embankment. Davis was sweating profusely. His pants were wet, and he smelled of alcohol. The deputies patted him down and gave him a field sobriety test, which he passed. One of the deputies then ran a check on the 1979 Ford Pinto plates, but he gave the dispatcher one wrong number, and the vehicle did not come up. 
The system in patrol units back then did not have the ability to do a background check on Davis's ID. So they could not verify if he had any warrants or even if he was who he said he was. When asked, Davis told them he was not on parole and had never been to prison. Lie, lie, lie. During a consent search of his Ford Pinto, the deputies found a paper bag on the floorboard with four unopened Budweiser beer cans. Davis actually opened a beer and started drinking it. The officers ordered him to pour it out. The deputies used tire change to get Davis's car out of the ditch and then followed him off the property. It was now 12.46 a.m., almost two hours since Polly had been taken. In the middle of the sheriff deputy's encounter with Davis, the Petaluma Police Department put out the first all-points bulletin about Polly's abduction. Unfortunately, the Petaluma PD had tagged the bulletin not for press release to avoid tipping off local media. Consequently, this limited the number of police units receiving the notice. The Sonoma County sheriffs operated off a different radio channel and did not get the bulletin about the bushy-haired, bearded stranger who had kidnapped a 12-year-old girl. When the San Francisco Police Department received the bulletin, they alerted the FBI that night. Because it was a witness kidnapping of a child, the FBI assisted with the investigation of the kidnapping. Special Agent Eddie Fryer from the Santa Rosa Field Office was in charge of the FBI's investigation. He arrived to the scene around 1.30 a.m. and set up a command post in coordination with state and local police. Agents began interviewing Eve, Jillian, Kate, and the three men in the granny unit. They also canvassed the neighborhood for other witnesses. The FBI's evidence recovery team arrived from San Francisco at the house at about 4 a.m., and assisted local police in processing the kidnapping scene. Using an alternative light source and reflective powders, the FBI lifted fingerprints and fibers from the bedroom. They sent the hair, fibers, and the white strips of knotted material used to tie the girl's wrist to the FBI lab at Quantico. Jillian and Kate were interviewed and provided all they remembered about the kidnapper. An artist from the police department created a composite drawing from the girl's description of the offender. Within hours, the media and volunteer groups distributed the first sketch of the stocky bearded man with dark wavy hair and a bandana tied around his forehead. Eventually, more than 60 thousand tips came in over the course of investigating Polly's abduction. Those tips generated 12,000 actionable leads. Some of them were promising, but they all eventually fizzled. All of the fingerprints they found were matched to Polly's family and friends, but a palm print did not match any of them. On October 23rd, Mark Kloss founded the Polly Kloss Foundation. It became a central location for the hundreds of volunteers who were working to find Polly. Over the next few weeks, volunteers distributed over 8 million flyers with Polly's photo and the sketches of the kidnapper. Her kidnapping became national news very quickly. It was one of the first cases to use the internet to spread Polly's photo 
and police sketches of the suspect across the entire country. Finally, on Sunday, November 27, almost two months after the abduction, there was a break. Dana Chaffee and a friend were hiking on Dana's property when they came across several discarded items on an embankment above her driveway. They found a pair of girls' red tights, a black adult-sized large sweatshirt, and a long strip of white, silky, knotted material. And lying a few feet from the clothes were an unrolled condom, a torn Rough Rider condom wrapper, two pieces of strapping tape, a beer bottle, an empty plastic six-pack holder, and a book of matches. Everything was approximately 30 yards from where Davis's car had been stuck in a ditch. Dana looked down the embankment and had a clear view of the exact spot where the white hatchback had been stuck. A Petaluma detective arrived to view the items and he immediately recognized the white knotted silky material. And hours later, the lab identified the white strip as a match to the ligatures used to tie up the girls. The material appeared to have been cut from a woman's slip. Now all they had to do was find Richard Allen Davis. On Tuesday, November 30th, FBI agents, Petaluma detectives, and state police tracked down Richard Allen Davis to the Coyote Valley Indian Reservation in Ukiah, California, about 70 miles north of Santa Rosa. Davis's sister lived there in a small rental house with her husband and four children. Agents spotted a white Ford Pinto hatchback outside the house, but Davis was not on the property. Minutes later, FBI agent Fryer got word that one of the local officers posted on the perimeter had stopped Davis driving a van onto the reservation. He was arrested and taken to the Mendocino County Jail, where he was placed in isolation. On December 1st, Kate and Jillian were driven to the jail to view Davis in a lineup. They could not positively identify him as the man who entered Polly's bedroom, tied them up, and took Polly. Upon reading about the arrest, a man named Marvin White showed up at the Mendocino County Jail on December 3rd, and he asked to speak with Davis. White owned a sheet metal company and regularly hired ex-convicts to help reintegrate them back into society. And he had briefly worked with Davis when he was paroled only four months earlier. White encouraged Davis to cooperate with police. He refused, believing the police had no evidence to convict him. You know what that tells me? Well, it tells me this guy was so narcissistic, despite his very long history of getting caught and imprisoned for his crimes, that he still thought he pulled off the perfect crime. Because he had been held in isolation, Davis was unaware that the FBI had lifted a palm print from Polly's bunk bed and had matched it to one of Davis's prints on file. When his friend, Mr. White, told him the news, he was stunned. A few hours later, Davis changed his mind and asked to speak to the police detective. When the detective called him, Davis confessed, and I quote, I fucked up big time. No, Richard, kidnapping and killing a kid is not a fuck up. Buying the wrong kind of milk is a fuck up. 
what you did was a premeditated rape and murder of a minor. And it's a capital offense, meaning you may have to pay for it with your own life. During a recorded two-hour interview, Davis told the detectives all the details about the day of the kidnapping and murder. He claimed that on the afternoon of October 1st, he had been drinking beer in the park when someone passed him a marijuana cigarette laced with PCP. Davis claimed he was in a drug-induced haze and could not remember anything before the time he had Polly in his car. This time, when asked, he said Polly was not alive. On December 4th, Davis led law enforcement to Polly's body off Highway 101 in Cloverdale. She was near an abandoned sawmill about 50 yards from the roadway and a plywood board had been thrown on top of her. Her clothes were inside out. Because her body was in an advanced state of decomposition, it was difficult to prove the cause of death. However, there were pieces of cloth, each tied into loops approximately three inches in diameter, on her neck, indicating she had been strangled. The investigators took Davis back to jail and spent the next nine hours taking his confession. When asked why he killed Polly, he said he did not know why, except that he was trying to, quote, cover his tracks and avoid being sent back to prison. And now this is what's interesting. He told them that Polly had been alive and sitting up on a hill on the embankment while the two sheriff's deputies interviewed him, something the investigators did not find credible. I'll tell you, what he said, that doesn't surprise me at all. I've heard it before. It's a classic case of a career criminal trying to make the police look bad. Like, if they had only searched a bit, they would have found her alive and she'd be saved. So it's their fault, not my fault. Her tights and the used condom were found nearby where his car became stranded. That tells me she was most likely raped and murdered by strangulation right there. Then he put her body in the trunk of his car. Too bad the cops didn't look in there, but let's move on. Davis said that after the sheriff deputies escorted him off the Pythian Road property, he returned minutes later to get Polly from the embankment. He told them she was alive and walked back to his pinto. I would bet my life that is not true. He then took her to the Cloverdale location and strangled her, according to him, because she had seen his face. Despite strong circumstantial evidence that David had sexually assaulted Polly, he continued to deny it. He repeatedly referred to Polly, a 4 foot 10, 80 pound, 12 year old girl, as, quote, that broad. Well, that's how he sees all females, as adult broads. The fact that he denied any sexual assault, that doesn't surprise me either. And here's why he denied it. Denial of a sex act during another crime is a classic ex-con move, and he had been in prison a lot. Having already been in prison, Davis knew how badly he'd be treated by other inmates if they knew him to be what they call a perv or raped a little girl. Lots of men in prison have daughters of their own, and they don't like sex offenders, to say the least. Child molesters and rapists are frequently beaten or even killed by other inmates.
Bosch Legacy returns. My name's Harry Bosch. I'm a private investigator. Now streaming in a two-episode premiere event. Maddie's been taken. Oh, God. His daughter is in the hands of a madman. Why do the police have been looking for me? The missing officer. And the clock is running out. Is she alive? Well, I'm not going to tell you that. But nothing can stop a father. We want to find her just as much as you do. I doubt that very much. From doing what the law can't. You got to let us do our job. Don't cut me out of this. You have no idea what I'm feeling right now. Harry, we have to do this the right way. You have to. I don't. Where is my daughter? Bosch Legacy. Watch the new season. Now streaming. Exclusively on Freebie. Richard Allen Davis was born on June 2nd, 1954 in San Francisco. He was the third child of five. His father, Robert, was a longshoreman who worked on the docks in San Francisco. His mother, Evelyn, was a member of the Paiute Indian tribe from Nevada. To describe Davis's childhood as miserable would be a profound understatement. Not only were both parents known to be severe alcoholics, his mother in particular was no less than a monster to Richard herself. Her preferred method of punishing him was horrible physical abuse, including burning his hand with fire as punishment to the point of blistering, and she did this more than once. Now, just think about that act for a second. That is nothing like a spanking or even a slap. What she did takes time and planning. And in the moments between the idea and the act of holding a child's hand over a fire, there's time to say to yourself, wait, that's not something I should do, or that's way over the top. I'll just send him to his room or anything else. But that didn't happen. And it didn't happen twice. That's nothing less than sadistic not to mention a felony that could have sent her to jail for child abuse. What do you think goes through a child's mind when his mother deliberately caused him intense pain? Fear and distrust, that's what. Not just then, but fear forever of the one person in the world who is supposed to love and protect him. And what does fear and distrust eventually morph into? Anger and resentment. Aside from being physically abusive, his mother was an emotionally detached woman. When Davis was only nine, she left his father. And according to a defense-appointed psychiatrist, he took her leaving as a rebuff, a rejection, and he blamed it on himself. Quote, his understanding was that he had suffered this terrible loss and that he was responsible for his own pain. When he was only 11, his parents finally divorced. Now, you might think that was a good thing in this case, but to a young child, a bad mom is better than no mom. When she lost custody of the kids, not because of abuse, by the way, but because she engaged in some kind of immoral act in front of the children, and that tells me it was probably either drugs or prostitution, Richard felt abandoned. His mother cut off communication with him all together. Abandoned children think the abandonment happened because they are unlovable. His father would marry and divorce twice more. But even though those women were not abusive to the five kids, nevertheless, they too divorced his father. 
And the pain of abandonment stung just as badly, if not more, than when his mother left. It certainly did not help that his father was often away working and was emotionally unavailable or physically abusive when he was there. Neighbors reported that Davis was a disturbed child. He burned the tails of cats and did similar cruel acts to dogs. And then he'd laugh after injuring them. Animal torture, a behavior frequently seen in the childhood of serial killers, is the greatest predictor of future bad acts. Davis was living with his grandmother in Chowchilla when he had his first arrest at the age of 12. He was caught stealing checks out of his neighbor's mailboxes and cashing them. That's pretty sophisticated for a 12-year-old. Only a few months later, he was sent to juvenile hall for cashing a stolen $10 money order. After that was a series of arrests for burglary. By the time he was in his teen years, Richard was drinking alcohol and using marijuana regularly. One of the things that alcohol and cannabis does to kids is negatively affect the prefrontal cortex brain function. So someone who has had an unstable home life, like Richard, is more likely to have trouble with planning and organizing behavior, and most importantly, with inhibiting impulses. I'd like to point out here that lots of teenagers have unstable home lives, drink and use drugs, and do not grow up to be rapists and killers. But I also think it's safe to say the groundwork of Richard's criminal future was his horrific upbringing, and it contributed to him becoming a very hateful, angry, and disturbed, ticking time bomb. Why do I think that? Back in the late 70s and early 80s, FBI profiler Robert Ressler headed the Criminal Personality Research Project where, along with colleagues, including John Douglas, he interviewed 36 convicted murderers, including many serial killers, inside U.S. prisons. They focused on their psychological and behavioral characteristics, their motives, and I think most importantly, their histories. They found out some very interesting things about serial killers, not the least of which was the prevalence of abuse of some kind in the childhood of serial killers was found to be six times the amount of abuse found in the general population. So where am I going with this? Did his mother's abuse, rejection, and abandonment cause her son to grow up hating women and young girls enough to want to rape and kill them? We'll never know for sure, but there's no way that it did not have a very serious effect on him while growing up. The connection between child abuse and serial killers is so clear that it led Robert Ressler to conclude, and I quote, let me state unequivocally, there is no such thing as the person who at age 35 suddenly changes from being perfectly normal and erupts into totally evil, disruptive, murderous behavior. The behaviors that are precursors to murder have been present and developing in that person's life for a long, long time, since childhood. When Richard was 15, his father turned him and his older brother over to juvenile authorities because he said they were incorrigible. So they spent weekends in juvie hall when dad was home from work. The truth is, he was gone Monday through Friday and he didn't want them around on the weekends. Not surprisingly, Richard dropped out of school as soon as he could at age 16. That same year, he was arrested for motorcycle theft. A probation officer and judge accepted his father's suggestion 
that he enlist in the army to avoid being sent to the California Youth Authority. He entered the army when he was 17, but it did nothing to change him, to turn him into a good guy. He was dishonorably discharged after 13 months, quote, for fights, arguments, and inability to adjust to army discipline, a.k.a. he could not follow orders. Or better that I say, he would not follow orders. When Davis was 19, he had a girlfriend, and she mysteriously shot herself and died after a party in her home. She was celebrating her Navy induction on the night of her death. Her family never believed it was a suicide and thought Davis had something to do with it. After all, he'd been the last person to see her alive. Between 1973 and 75, when Davis was in his very early 20s, he was arrested many, many times for burglary. He was sentenced to a year in county jail, but was allowed to leave jail to attend a Native American drug and alcohol treatment program. However, it wasn't long before his parole was revoked and he was sent back to state prison for violating the terms of his parole in the 1973 burglary and for a jail escape. Unfortunately, he was only in jail that time for a year. By the time he was in his mid-20s, Davis was a full-on sociopathic sexual sadist. Richard Allen Davis had many check marks in the negative column of life, that's for sure. But he was not psychotic. He did not hear voices, nor was he delusional. He was not compelled to commit crimes because he was mentally ill. He knew what was right, and he knew what was wrong. And he chose to do wrong. One month after he was released from jail in September of 76, he was rearrested for kidnapping a 26-year-old woman at knife point. He forced the woman into the passenger seat of her car and drove to a deserted area. He exposed himself and tried to force her to perform oral sex. The woman, and this is incredible, grabbed his knife with one hand and with the other, she opened the car door and fled. She ran like the wind to the road and flagged down a passing car. Davis was apprehended really quickly by an off-duty police officer. He told two court-appointed psychiatrists that he heard a woman's voice telling him to commit the crime, saying, quote, I had the feeling she wanted something done to her. Her voice was plaguing him with questions about what it would be like to be raped. Sure, Richard, that happened. After Davis was convicted and sent to prison, he was transferred from the county jail to Napa State Hospital evaluation after he tried to hang himself in a cell at Alameda County Jail. In December of that year, Davis escaped from the hospital and broke into a Napa Valley home and beat a woman in her bed with a poker. She screamed and he fled. Three days later, he attempted to kidnap a woman from a restaurant parking lot. He hid inside her car with the shotgun he had stolen. The woman saw that he had bindings to tie her up and she fought back. She jammed her gear shift with a rag, then grabbed a gun she had hidden under the seat. She opened her car door, rolled onto the ground, and fired the gun six times while he was fleeing. Oh, how I wish she had been a better shot. The next day, he broke into a home. Police found him hiding in the bushes outside the house and arrested him. Llewellyn Jones, a retired psychiatrist who interviewed Davis after his arrest for that December crime spree, said, 
Davis told him of engaging twice a day in autoerotic fantasies about tying up the female victims of his prior crimes. I think that's a really nice way, a clinical way, of saying tying up women was his masturbatory fantasy of choice. And remember, you've heard me say this in prior episodes about sexual sadists. Tying their victim up is really important. It's a big part of their fantasy. They like the idea of a victim being helpless. The psychiatrist also said Davis showed no remorse or sympathy for those he had victimized in his long, long criminal history. Davis had a long history of tying up women, about 20 years, in fact. He is a sexual sadist, and bondage of the victim is common pre-rape or pre-murder behavior. For this type of sex offender, he's living out a fantasy that probably started when his pubescent sexual awakening started. Was it his mother's fault that he became a sadist? Maybe. We'll never know. There's no blood test for that. In November of 1984, two years after he was paroled, Davis committed his second kidnapping. Richard got into an argument with a woman over a car that she had sold him. He broke into her apartment and pistol whipped her when she refused to return his money. Davis and his then-girlfriend, a known drug dealer, drove the woman to a bank and forced her to withdraw $6,000 from her account. The couple fled to Washington State and committed several more robberies before they were caught. Davis was sentenced to 16 years in prison for the November 1984 robbery, kidnapping, and assault. But his sentence was halved after he earned time off for work and good behavior. He was paroled from California Men's Colony in San Luis Obispo after serving only eight years of a 16-year sentence. And in June of 93, he was released to a halfway house in Redwood City. In August, he took a bus to visit his sister and brother-in-law who lived on the Coyote Valley Indian Reservation in Ukiah. That bus also made a stop in Petaluma. During that weekend, Davis bought his brother-in-law's 1979 white Ford Pinto hatchback. In September, he asked the housing facility for weekend passes to allegedly visit his mother in Petaluma to ask her for money. Over the next month, Davis drove the Ford Pinto back and forth between Ukiah and Petaluma. Despite violating his parole, he never returned to the transitional housing facility. And obviously, they did nothing about it. One day later, he kidnapped and murdered Polly Kloss. Through the years, I've often been asked why Davis would risk such a bold abduction, entering the bedroom of a child who was not only in her own home, but was with two friends in the room, meaning there were two witnesses alive that could potentially identify him. Was he bold or just stupid? Well, it was a combination of both. He did have an IQ of 129. I think that beats me. But that doesn't necessarily affect everyday choices that people make. The boldness of his act reflects the urgency he felt, the need to rape and kill a female as soon as he could. The bolder the abduction, the greater the chance the victim will be killed within an hour or two. Bold abductions speak to the killer's frame of mind at the time. In this case, he was in murder mode. They know what they want to do, and they do not want to wait. 
And he was definitely intoxicated, which no doubt affected his judgment. It's called liquid courage for a reason. According to one of the prosecutors, quote, if this bondage is what he was thinking about 20 years ago, he hasn't changed a bit. He's still tying up females. Evidence presented in the trial indicates Davis entered Polly's home with prepared strips of cloth to bind the hands of the seventh grader and her two friends. However, Davis has always denied that there was a sexual element to his attack. As I mentioned before, faced with years in prison, he did not want to be labeled a child molester. Leonti Thompson, a psychiatrist who interviewed Davis in 1978, said the defendant, quote, showed no signs of remorse or sympathy or compassion for the people he had victimized. And that is the hallmark trait of antisocial personality disorder. And on that, you will get no argument from me. On December 7th, 1993, Richard Allen Davis was charged with kidnapping and murder and booked into Sonoma County Jail. More charges were added later, and they included two counts of false imprisonment, two counts of assault, that would be on Kate and Jillian, burglary, two counts of robbery, attempting a lewd act with a child, and attempted molestation. His trial began February 5th in 1996 in San Jose. San Jose is about 100 miles south of where the crime took place. Apparently, his defense attorneys felt he couldn't get a fair trial in a county where Polly lived. Davis had confessed to kidnapping and murdering Polly, and it was on tape. But still, he pled not guilty. A murder conviction was certain. But if it was paired with four special circumstances, that being kidnapping, robbery, burglary, and an attempted lewd act upon a child under the age of 14, that meant an automatic sentence of life without parole or the death penalty. Davis hoped to avoid the death penalty by disproving he had sexually abused Polly. But he couldn't. Evidence proved he had been in Polly's room because of the white bindings, his palm print, and DNA from a single hair with the root intact. Prosecutors now had to prove that there was some physical touching with the intent to gratify sexual desire. Originally, the FBI lab identified semen on Polly's underpants, but subsequent tests were unable to verify it. They were unable to extract DNA from the condom. And by the way, let me tell you why he was wearing a condom, and it was not to protect Polly from diseases or himself. One of the things we profilers took note of back in those days was if a condom was used in a sexual assault, you could pretty much count on the offender had been in prison. In prison, he learned wear a condom. DNA was new, but by the 90s, prisoners knew about it. The FBI lab scraped red fibers from the black sweatshirt found on Pythian Road. The fibers were microscopically, chemically, and physically the same as Polly's flannel nightgown. This indicated there was contact between Davis's sweatshirt and Polly's nightgown. A jury of six women and six men deliberated for seven days. On June 18, 1996, they found Davis guilty of all 10 felony counts, including the four special circumstances, making him eligible for the death penalty. 
Upon hearing the verdict, Davis turned toward the cameras, winked, puckered his lips in a kiss, and raised his two middle fingers. But he wasn't done shocking society. Weeks later, at the penalty phase of his trial, Richard Allen Davis was permitted to speak. He denied sexually assaulting Polly. But even more laughable and horrible is that he accused Mark Kloss, her father, of sexually abusing his daughter. In fact, what he exactly said was he didn't rape Polly because she said to him, please don't do me like my daddy. Just when you thought things couldn't get any worse. A visibly shocked courtroom gasped and booed. And enraged, and rightfully so, Mark Kloss had to be escorted from the courtroom. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review. Follow Killer Psyche on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen one week early and ad-free. In the episode notes, you'll find some links and offers from our sponsors. Please support them. By supporting them, you help us offer the show for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a survey at wondery.com slash survey. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Additional writing and director of research is Ann Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. With audio assistance from Katie Corfe and Matt Dyson. Jada Williams is our production coordinator. The executive in charge of production for Treefort is Oscar Dito. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Wachneen, and the co-executive producer is Julie Bird. Lastly, our executive producers are myself, Candace DeLong, Kelly Garner, and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marshall Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. 